God, I will give thanks to you forever. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 231, Come Christians Join to Sing. Would you please stand? Let us pray. Almighty God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may turn to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. To those who are gathered in this place, who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. It's my great privilege to welcome you to worship here at First Baptist Church of West Point. All of you who are gathered together here in our sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online. And I hope that you have prepared your hearts and your minds to worship the living God this morning. Let's continue in that worship by singing hymn number 57, If You Will Only Let God Guide You.
From Psalm 6. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me. My bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you, and Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. The words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let's stand and sing hymn 415. Moment by moment.
proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach his throne with confidence. In faith and in penitence, let us confess our sins now before God and one another, first silently and then using a prayer of confession that I'll provide. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news of the gospel from 1 Peter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. It is by faith in Jesus Christ that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Christ's righteousness and his righteousness alone have brought us into the kingdom of heaven. Listen now for God's will for our lives in that kingdom. Taken from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets." who were before you. Let's now stand and sing, Blessed Are They. Would you please stand?
we prepare to hear God's word read to us and proclaim, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask now that you would capture our imaginations and our thoughts, that you would lead us in our meditations and the words that are spoken and proclaimed. We ask that by your Spirit you would, you would break open our hearts and till them up that they might be receptive, fertile ground, and that deep within you would plant your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Old Testament lesson today comes to us from Genesis chapter 2 and 3, selected verses. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of, no of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this is the gospel from Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in the glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our epistle lesson this morning again comes from Romans, the fifth chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. 
And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as in sin reign, so as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the intriguing and I would confess frustrating aspects of researching genealogy, something that I've kind of gotten into over the past few years is when you run into a kind of a dead end or gaps in, in a family line. Individuals can appear out of nowhere without any paper trail, I guess, so to speak. You don't know who their parents were, where they came from. Other times people just disappear in like fashion. You don't know what happened to them or where they went. This obviously isn't how it works in reality though, right? People don't just come out of nowhere. And they don't just disappear into nowhere. Something happens. And so when you are trying to put this together in a family tree, you look for clues and you follow leads. And sometimes those don't pan out. But you always can learn something interesting in that pursuit. And that has been the case for me. I have learned a great deal about the tragic plight of humanity. In the second decade of the 19th century, a young woman named Mary married a slightly older man named Daniel in the state of North Carolina. Both appear to be from established, well-respected families. Though it isn't clear what either's relationship is with those families, how they got along, or how the families felt about their marriage. Usually there's not a reason to question that, but what happens in their life raises some questions. Mary and Daniel have children, at least two boys. And then Daniel dies. He dies in debt and intestate. That is, he dies without a will. Mary finds herself in court, pleading for mercy and forbearance as all of her husband's lands and belongings are to be sold to pay off this great debt that he has. She is given one year to remain in the home and a stipend from the receipts of the items that are sold. Where is her extended family in this time? I do not know. All but one brother at this point are living in West Tennessee, but there's certainly male. I don't know what, what the relationship is. At some point over the next 15 years, Mary and at least one of her sons will end up in East Tennessee on a small patch of land that is a far cry from the near 200 acres that they lived on when her husband was alive. What became of the other son? I don't know. But Mary lived out the remainder of her days at the home of her son, whose name was George, there in East Tennessee, in, appear, in what appears to be sustenance farming, a life of sustenance farming. The debts of Daniel impacted the remainder of their lives as well as the lives of George's children. Now about the same time, 
somewhere along the North Carolina-Virginia border, three children found themselves orphaned. Their mother, having died shortly after giving birth, their father passing away just over a year later. He also was in debt, and his estate was sold to pay off that debt. However, they were adopted by what appears to be their mother's first cousins. A woman who had married a man who held a great deal of land and was a well-established lawyer. Eventually, he would become a judge. The couple was childless up to that point, and the adoption appears to have been a gift to both the adopters and the adoptees. The two boys end up going to university, both become practicing lawyers, and they appear to have done quite well for themselves and for their descendants. Their little sister would marry into a family with even more land holdings than the family she was adopted with, and she would go on to have ten children, which is uh, impressive to say the least. Two very different outcomes for children who found themselves in very similar situations. Two living lives in the shadow of their father's debt and death, and the other, the other three, being adopted into a new life with new opportunities. Now, these contrasting situations, contrasting themes and outcomes are not so far from what Paul would have us consider today. In a way, that is somewhat difficult for interpreters that are as far removed from Paul as we are. Uh, the, the Apostle links what he is saying in what we've read today with what we have been considering over the past two weeks. The hope that comes from God's gift of righteousness. A hope that even dares to allow us to rejoice in the face of our afflictions. Because we have the testimony of God's love, His love for us, born witness within us by the Holy Spirit, and then objectively displayed in the cross of Christ, where Jesus has died not for righteous people, but for sinners, that we might be reconciled to God. So as Paul begins verse 12, here in Romans chapter, chapter 5, he starts with a therefore, tying what he's about to say with what he has just said. And pretty much everybody who comes to this nowadays is sort of going, it's related, but I'm not exactly sure what the relationship is. This is, this is how it should read all together, beginning in Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So what's the connection well, first, I think it remains that we are talking about hope. This entire portion is about hope from chapter 5 in the, through the preceding chapters. We are talking about the hope that comes from this gift of God's righteousness to us in Christ Jesus. Second, I think that we are moving outward in what are kind of concentric circles of thought. We have peace with God, a standing in grace that lets us rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Being restored to that glory, the, the glory that Adam lost, that we all fall short of in our sin. That translates into a hope in the here and now. Even into the kind of hope that allows us to rejoice in our suffering, at least in what God does in and through our suffering. We ever do that because we know, we know our ultimate destination is with God and that the Almighty One loves us. 
because He has given us the Holy Spirit who bears witness within us. He has displayed this for all to see in the cross, the cross of Christ. So this first circle, I think, is about our hope for our, in our own suffering, this kind of way in which we, we move through life, hoping from one moment to the next, whatever comes our way, we hope in, in God. Hope that what we, will, we hope what we will have when we are fully reconciled face to face before the Almighty for all of eternity. And then the second circle is a hope that is anchored in the love that we know because of Christ's suffering. So that kind of moves us beyond just our own subjective, reality, subjective hope to this broader objective display that is for all of us, that we all share. And it is in that passage that Paul also begins to talk about our deliverance from the wrath of God, from, from this greater, greater cosmic reality. And that moves us sort of into this third circle, which I think is today's topic, this cosmic reality. Things that are far, far greater than just me, far greater than all of us gathered here, but that play out on a, a scale that encompasses all of humanity, the hosts of heaven, So clinging to hope in the face of our own affliction, it can be daunting. It's a daunting enough task for us as individuals. We have this gift of the Holy Spirit who bears witness, who works within us an endurance. And yet, I think Paul is acutely aware that even then, we become aware that our struggle fits within a bigger picture of suffering, one that can overwhelm the bravest of saints. Even on our best days, there are things going around, around, on around us that are perplexing to us. We can feel like we are walking the righteous path. And yet all around us are those who seem indifferent to righteousness and in fact are willingly carrying out, carrying out sinful actions that bring great harm and injury to others and sometimes to ourselves. I mean, we are like the psalmist. We cry out to God because of our enemies. I want to realize that sometimes we are other people's enemies too. We are collaborators in this great struggle with the enemy. Can we dare to have hope in the face of this? I mean, fair enough. I've, I've had my faith in God in the face of this great illness. But why is it that I can never seem to shake this sin that right when I think I'm doing all right, I come back and I hurt somebody? When I think of this struggle of, or struggle to hope, I often think of two stanzas in the Christmas carol, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It's the third and fourth stanzas. I don't know if you know these, but it comes after the triumphant to tolling of, of the bells throughout all of Christendom. The third verse starts, And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Sin and death are all around us. They have held sway over this world since time immemorial, since we were driven from the garden, Adam and Eve cast out. Even when we are gifted with the endurance to bear up under our own suffering, we can 
We can look around and know sin and death remain here. We can be fooled into thinking that Jesus is, I guess, or living like Jesus is simply our own little Jesus. Here for our tiny struggles and our ordeals, losing sight of the glory of the triumphant King of King and King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Paul will take us through an exercise in comparison and contrast to highlight where we are in this cosmic ordeal and what exactly the one who is the fullest expression of God's love has actually accomplished. There are two figures, two figures who stand as heads for humanity, two figures whose actions impact all. There is Adam. He is the one man through whom sin came into the world and through sin, death. It is because of Adam that sin and death spread to all of his descendants. We all don't commit the same sin as Adam, but we all sin. We all die. We are all born into a condition of spiritual death, separated from, at war with, in rebellion against the God who is life itself. I want to come back and look more closely at how Paul speaks of the law in passages like verse 13. But for today, it's enough to note that Paul is saying, we are all guilty. We are all guilty. First, a certain guilt has been imputed to us because of Adam's original sin. Not all of his sins, but certainly the original sin of both Adam and Eve. Paul doesn't explain how. There's no deep theological argumentation going on. It simply is as is evident by the fact that all continue to sin and all die. We live under the repressive reign of sin and death, sin reigning in death. Those, us, who were made to exercise dominion over all of creation as God's image bearers, we now exist under the dominion of sin and death. You know, that's just heartbreaking and startling, isn't it, to think of it in that way, but that is the truth. God gave us dominion over creation. And with one act of rebellion, we now live under the dominion, under the reign of sin and death. The one trespass of God's commandment committed by Adam and Eve led to condemnation for all of mankind. This is Paul's summary of the situation in verse 18. We were made sinners that by the one act of disobedience, Adam's disobedience, we became sinners. We often want to object to the fairness of this, right? I mean, come on, this guy did this eons ago. How can this be held against us? I note three things. Nothing about Paul's statement is at odds with the state of humanity and the world. Nothing. Out of all the theological formulations that have attempted to address the state of humanity, the state of the world, the universal nature of sin, of death, Paul's statements are the simplest, the most cohesive, and the most thorough accounting. They might not be the most palatable, but they're the ones that hold together the best. Second, what action, what action does any human being take that is wholly isolated, that does not have some impact on others, particularly on one's family? 
our very thoughts eventually find their way to some expression or action or inaction that has consequences for others. This seems even more true of our, of our sinful thoughts and actions. Even the sins that we commit alone in the solitude of our homes are connected to others in one way or another. The envy, animosity, spiteful thoughts we harbor may seem contained in our minds, but they find a way of spilling out every now and then into our lives and poisoning relationships. The lusts that we feed and allow to fester may seem contained to the dark corners of our home, but they typically involve either the exploitation of other people or our own object objectification of others who are made in the image of God. Cancers may lie concealed for years, but eventually they manifest themselves. No man is an island. We object to, to the headship of Adam, and yet we all know headship quite well. Our heads of state, our government, make decisions that impact all of us. We may not even agree with them, but they impact us. And we live with the consequences of that. And that sort of leads me to the third, third thing I would say. If we jettison the headship of Adam and the imputation of Adam's sin as objectionable to our sensibilities, then we also lose the hope of Christ's imputed righteousness. For this is where Paul is going in this line of reasoning. So whereas Adam earned, earned his, his condemnation, and we have all joined in the work of sin, earning that wage, the other greater head for humanity... God has provided for us, himself does not offer us something to earn, but offers us a gift. Adam's trespass of God's commandment brought death to all. In his grace, God freely offers life to all in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Much more. It seems to me that this way of, of talking is, is akin to just things that we've experienced in life. Have you ever bent something and gone, uh-oh, and then tried to straighten that thing back out? That is nearly impossible to do. Or maybe you've done something that I've done, wadded up a piece of paper, only to realize, whoops, that's the document that I need, and tried to iron out all the wrinkles and make it presentable again. When we were children, my mother had been given, I think, given this porcelain figurine of a girl with a fishing pole. I think it reminded her of her childhood. And where we lived, and we had this living room, and there weren't a lot of places to put it, and she put it on this end table uh, right there in the living room. And of course, my brother and I, we love to wrestle and fight and throw things in the living room. <laughs> so we broke that porcelain doll, broke the arm off of it, and my mom tried to find all the pieces and glue that that arm back on and it never looked the same and to make it worse we broke it not once but we broke it at least three times if my mom ever watches this I'm very sorry about that it was never the same again though never that is not the case with what Christ has done for us We see Christ undoing, outdoing, and accomplishing what Adam did and, in fact, could not do. 
He undoes what Adam did. He does more than what Adam could do. In Matthew chapter 4, we got a great example of this. We see a very similar situation to what Adam and Eve faced. But the contrasts are extreme. Our first parents are in a garden. They are surrounded by the fruit and the vegetation of everything that they need to sustain their bodies, to delight in eating, to enjoy, to live. Jesus is in the wilderness, in the place of banishment <laughs> with us. He does not have what he needs to sustain his body. He is hungry and without. He is hungry after 40 days of being without. I don't know about you, but four hours is about the max for me. 40 days. The first temptation Jesus faces is in regard to something he needed. Adam and Eve, look at this fruit. Look at all these fruits. Jesus has nothing. And there's a rock. And the devil says, you know, you could make that into bread. Something that you need and I know you won't. Matthew tells us Jesus was hungry. I don't think he just tells us that like it's, oh yeah, by the way. Something your body needs and is crying out for. Adam and Eve gave in to the first temptation they faced. Jesus endures three increasingly grand temptations of body, faith, and power. Eve seems to add to God's Word in order to, to make the case against the devil. Well, we can't even touch that tree. Jesus simply relies on the Word of God and speaks it back to the devil. He clings to it. Both Adam and Christ die. One's death will bring death to all his descendants. The others will bring life to all who will come to him. How much more how much more has Christ accomplished? Adam's sin subjected image bearers to the reign of death. Christ restores the image of God. He renews the image of God within us. With this free gift of righteousness, He sets us now to reign in life. Back to the position of dominion. Back to having life. Life with God, eternal life. But what does that have to do with the hope of here and now? Because here and now doesn't sound like a lot of that. Yeah. The Treaty of Ghent was a treaty that ended the War of 1812. It was signed in Flanders and Belgium, wherever. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1814. You know about the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans was fought nearly two weeks after that was signed. After the war had ended. Things like that do tend to happen in wars. We live in a time a time of a great many battles within the sphere of death and sin. And some of those battles would cause us to be disheartened. But the declaration of the good news is that the war is already over. It is finished. Skirmishes may endure, but the war has been won. Christ is the victor. The question for us 
is whether we will whether or not we will accept this victory and come to him to receive the gift that he offers us God's righteousness life and if we will do that for those of us who have will we continue on in the hope for the day when the fullness of that victory, the fullness of what he has accomplished, becomes made completely manifest. May it be so. May we endure in hope. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In response to God's word, let's stand and affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we're going to sing uh, an older hymn that summarizes what we have read today. We're going to sing it to a very, very familiar tune, uh, the one that we sing when I survey the wondrous cross too. So uh, let's, I think you have the music in your hand, so let's sing together.
we have quite a few announcements. Um, sign-up sheets here uh, at the front. There are quite a few sign-up sheets. One for uh, our upcoming ministry positions and uh, places of service in the church uh, for the coming year. Also, um, worship participation. If you'd like to participate uh, in some of the parts of the worship service, there's a sheet here for that. And then also our Wednesday night Bible studies uh, for the fall are starting on September 21st. We'll be having dinner, and so we need a head count. Uh, and if you would, uh, you could sign up here on one of these sheets for that to let us know that you'll be coming on, on Wednesday nights. Also, in that vein, there's a few things we need to do to get ready for Wednesday night, which is um, a lot of wiping down and cleaning of, of furniture. And that will happen this coming Saturday. Saturday. May, what? Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I lose track of the schedule sometimes. So this coming Saturday, 7.30 a.m. to start early and hopefully. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we're going... I'm not sure what it means, but we're going we're going we're going to be we're going we're going to plan our best to uh, to have it ready and and to work together to to work, have our church ready. We're of course hosting the Presbyterians with this, so always nice to put our best foot forward, however that foot may look. Um, uh, also, there is a. Um, a senior adult choir for Troop County called the New Horizons Senior Adult or New Horizons Choir. It's a senior adult choir. It meets at First Baptist on the Square in Lagrange. Um, it's open to anybody in in the area, and they begin their first practice of the season tomorrow at 11 a.m. in the adult choir room in First Baptist. There's a phone number in the bulletin on the front on the you know especially note part that front page. Uh, Anthony Criswell's phone number. If you are interested, you can call Anthony and he will give you all the details. And something that we may need to sign up sheet for, but I don't have one, a fall festival. There is a fall festival that's going to be over in Lynette. It's a community-wide fall festival churches are doing. And we'll have a tent, right? And we need baked goods and volunteers for the tent. So... Um, you can see shared about that. Please do. Yes. I'll respond to uh, send out an email last week and respond to that. See me, and I'll have a sign up sheet for next week. And uh, yes, thank you, especially with for your help with baked goods for the bake sale. Yes. Good to have baked goods for a bake sale. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I concur. All right. So uh, that should be all of the announcements. I pray. Okay. Um, prayers. Those of you who would uh, like to give praises or share updates or make mention of new prayer requests. Yes, sir. My dad's going to have to have hip surgery yes. again on Friday. Yes. So Sherry's dad, buddy, will be having hip surgery again this coming Friday um, over in Opelika. So we want to keep him in our prayers. Yes, an ongoing, ongoing conflict in, in Ukraine um, and the, both sides of that conflict. They certainly all need our, our prayers, God's mercies. In the country of Bangladesh, third out of the the war. Yes, Bangladesh um, is experiencing a lot of flooding. Yes, our, well, yes, this is right. I think, uh, I think the good news is Jackson, Mississippi has water. Bad news is it looks like mud. So, um, but we, there's, there's not just in Mississippi, there's flooding, there's drought and fires. Uh, we have a lot of issues in, here at home as well. Okay. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, with the humility of sinful creatures and with the confidence of those who are redeemed by Christ, 
we come to you asking, asking that the seed of your word that has been sown this morning into our lives, that it would take deep root, that neither persecution or ridicule would cause it to wither, nor the, the cares of this world would choke it out, but that it would bring forth manifold fruit that would be a blessing in our lives, to the lives of those around us, and to your glory, Father. We ask that you would continue to work in, in our congregation, making us a people who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are agents of your kingdom, and who glorify you in thought and word and speech. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, and we, we pray for, for your body, the body of Christ all around the world. We ask that on this day your word would be proclaimed in pulpits in every country and in homes and in places where our brothers and sisters at times worship in secret. We ask that, that they would know your presence and your blessing. We pray for those that we have sent out into places where, where the word of Christ, his name, is not known, that you would open doors of opportunity for them, that you would comfort and strengthen them, and that you would bless their work. We ask, Father, for our own nation, for our leaders, for wisdom, for cooperation, for faithfulness, that we might live, live peaceful lives. And Father, for our friends, our family, we continue to ask for your mercies and your, inter or your intervention. We pray, Father, for, for Buddy today and this upcoming surgery, that you would strengthen his body. You would be with those who, in whose care that he is placed, that you would grant them skill and wisdom. And Father, for places like Ukraine, where a conflict endures for those on both sides, we ask for, for your mercy, for your grace, and for peace. And we pray, Father, for, for those around the world who are suffering because of natural disasters, places like Bangladesh and even here at home, we ask that you would be merciful to, to these people, to all people. And that those of us who have the means would be faithful in, in reaching out and caring for those that we can. We ask these things in the name of Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Remember the words of Christ, brothers and sisters. Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.